Hello again, how's it going? Uh, it's Clara and I've got another science video for you. So uh, I'm continuing with these thin film deposition techniques and now in this video I'm going to be talking about magnetron sputtering. Magnetron sputtering is another uh, physical vapour deposition technique and it's the one that I have spent probably most of my scientific career working with. So um, I we used it a little bit when I worked for the company and they did use it, but they used it in a different way. However, my entire um, PhD, my doctorate was all on uh, magnetron sputtering, a particular type of magnetron sputtering, but we're not going to go into that right now. And then my postdocs and then, you know, it's it's the bread and butter. It's what I do in the lab day in, day out. It's the last set of experiments I did. Um, which was bef just before lockdown, that was with magnetron sputtering. So uh, without further ado, um, let's get into it, I guess. <laughs> All right, so we're talking about magnetron sputtering. Like I say, it's a physical vapor deposition technique, and I will talk about it. And once again, you know, I've talked about this before, there's a lot of similarities with different techniques. So once again, we have a chamber, we have a substrate in there. That's what we're growing our films on. And uh, like with uh, Paul Slater's deposition, we have a target. So this is a target material. However, we use it in a different way. So what we do with this target is we actually apply a magnetic field behind it. So there'll be an outer ring and an inner ring. So the outer ring will be a complete closed circuit uh, of one pole and then a different pole on the inside. And you can configure this in different ways. So you can have different relative strengths. You can change the magnetic field. You can have them uh, further away or closer to each other. And there's different, different things that you can do with this. But the basic thing is you've got an outer field and an inner field behind the target. And so that creates this magnetic field. And uh, of course, gives it the name of magnetron sputtering. And once again, we suck all the air out. Again, we want this at high vacuum. But once we've done that, what we also do is we apply a, a large um, high voltage, and this will be negative in respect to ground. And so we apply this high voltage, it might be 400 volts. It depends on the technique, depends on the size, it depends on an awful lot of things. But um, we're talking hundreds of volts here. And this is great. So this is our building blocks of magnetron sputtering. And hopefully you'll see that, you know, there's already things that are different than the others. And these are some of the systems. So these are two systems that we've got in the lab. Um, they're old equipment that we've got, you know, they're different shapes, they're different types. And to be honest, you know, um, we've replaced bits, you know, these are sort of 40 year old machines. Um, and so we do different stuff with them, but we can still use them. And um, actually what you can see in uh, the, one of them is a, a pinkish, uh, purplish glow, and that's a plasma. And that's, um, apart from it being a fantastic technique, I love uh, having uh, plasma glows, and I'll talk about that a little bit further on. So, okay, so we've got our uh, we've got our target behind it. We've got magnets and we've applied a, a, a voltage to it. So what's next? In this system, so it's under vacuum, but there are electrons in the system. We've applied a voltage. There's electrons traveling around them. They bounce around, they bounce off the walls, they travel at a particular speed. And what might happen is that they might get caught in the magnetic field of the magnetron. And when they do, they bounce around. So they actually travel in a kind of corkscrew fashion because the magnetic field is an outer field and an inner field, and they corkscrew around um, the target. And this area we actually call the racetrack because that's what it's doing. The electrons are racing around this area. So hopefully we trap one of these electrons. Now, what we can also do is introduce, say, some argon. So in this case, I've introduced some inner argon and it's just bouncing around the system. Now, you know, the relative speeds, let's be honest, you know, this isn't to, to time scale. And also an atom is much, much, much bigger than the electron that we've got in the system. You know, this is just a, you know, a animated 
uh, representation of the electron and the atom and the time scales we can't even pretend that they're um accurate but these are things that can happen and so this argon uh, can bounce around the, ch the chamber and because it's in vacuum um we aren't bouncing into air uh, so we're not bouncing off other things it can just you know travel around and that's really cool and we use argon so argon is an inert gas and it's relatively cheap so that is why we use it um, other gases are slightly better but uh, like I say the relative cost and the fact that it's an inert gas means that we we actually use an awful lot of it and that's pretty good and we are actively pumping all this time. We're keeping the system under vacuum. So, you know, some of this argon will get pumped out. We're not putting in one atom at a time. We're actually flowing argon in the system. And so these argon atoms are bouncing around, but there's quite a, a large free mean path be, before they start bouncing off each other. Now, there's a certain point where if we're really lucky, what might happen is this argon might collide with this electron, all right? And so let's see if we're lucky. Oh, yes, it happened. Right. It's almost like I planned it. So, so there was a lot of stuff went on there. Uh, and, I, and so I'm going to slow it down. But one of the things that happened was the argon and the electron uh, collided with each other. And so when it did, what happened was that the um, argon and the electron collided we knocked off an electron off the atom, which turned it into an ion, a positive ion. That positive ion got attracted to the negative voltage and accelerated towards it and hit it really fast. And when it did, we had this kind of like snooker or pool reaction where it hits an atom on the top with a lot of force that causes it to bounce into another atom that causes it to bounce into another atom. And then one of them got ejected off. So like I say, it's just like playing pool. The balls hit each other and one gets knocked off. And the electron that we knocked off the atom that became the iron started traveling around the vacuum. So let's just go over that again. The iron and the atom collide, an electron gets knocked off. That becomes an iron. It accelerates towards the negative voltage because it's positive. As it does, it hits the atoms. They all start bouncing around and one of them will eventually get knocked off. And that travels through the vacuum and hopefully if we've uh, put all the uh, geometry in place right that should travel through the vacuum and land on the substrate. So that part is kind of like we saw with the other deposition techniques. Uh, we have the target or the uh, source of the crucible and we, uh, we cause that material to uh, travel through the vacuum and land on the substrate. And then lots of other things can happen. So this electron here can carry on bouncing around. This iron, I mean, it'll hit the target. It might bounce off. It might recombine with an electron and become an atom again, which could get sucked out, like I say. Um, it's no longer positive or negative, so it can it's not confined by the magnetic field or the negative voltage. And this electron that we released before could bounce around and end up getting caught in this magnetic field and it all starts all over again and this happens a lot this there's a lot of coll uh, collisions happening and there's more than just um this happening like we're releasing different electrons and all sorts there's a lot of things happening but that's basically the fundamentals of magnetron sputtering but we don't see these uh, atoms and ions traveling around right but we can actually observe it because what happens is we get a glow. So basically there's a lot of energy being given off. And this energy, um, you know, there's, there's, there's all this energy, there's all these collisions, all these things happening. And so there's a lot of light being released. And we can actually measure the wavelength of the light to see what's in there. So we see this plasma glow, which I showed you earlier, um, and I'll show you another picture in a minute, but we can actually measure the wavelengths um, of these different things. But it's basically, you know, it, basically what we've got with this plasma is we've got sort of lightning in this box. That's, that's exactly what it is. Um, and indeed, um, you know, the plasma lightning forms a plasma. That's what it does. So 
it's very representative uh, but we've got it in a box instead of you know in the sky and like i say we can actually measure the different wavelengths and that's because the different gases we use the different materials we use all give off different colored plasma so before we had this sort of reddish plasma that was a lithium based uh, target and we used argon but we also had some nitrogen in there because we were trying to add a nitrogen to the uh, material uh, what happens is it, as the material is traveling through the vacuum um, if you've got a reactive gas in there you can form a compound and I might talk about that in another video a little bit more uh, in this example we have this nice blue glow so that is a titanium target so that is using titanium with a particular type of sputtering called a uh, high power impulse magnetron sputtering and it and it's got argon uh, gas in there as the working gas and it gives us this really glorious blue color uh, and the other example i've got is that's a zinc based um target and it's uh, it'll have a percentage of aluminium in it and it's got argon in the system and we've also got oxygen so we're actually making um zinc oxide or aluminium doped zinc oxide azo and so coming back to when i was talking about examples uh when i was talking about what is material um science and what thin films do we make the titanium uh, if we introduce oxygen in there and form titania, then that's our photocatalytic material, right? That's what we can use on solar glass and stuff like that. Um, and I was talking about mobile phones and touchscreens. They have a transparent conductive oxide, and that's what one of the uh, and one of the materials that we use is uh, aluminium zinc oxide. So they're examples of different materials that we're using to make. Um, for different products um and like i say it, it's got this really glorious pretty uh colored glow and i gotta admit i used to dye my hair to match the plasma sometimes because <laughs> um because that's who i am <laughs> so we see all these atoms uh, so this plasma glow is representative of all these different atoms coming off now, I actually taught, and I've said before as well, that you know, depending on how the material arrives at the uh, substrate, we change the structure and therefore we change the properties. So I actually have some examples in this case. Um, so there's lots of things we can do. We can, obviously there's the different materials we can use, there's the different gas, there's the flow of gas, there's the background pressure, the voltage, we can change the magnetic configuration, um, the voltage that we apply to it, how we apply it so we can pulse it or it could just be a, a continuous dc voltage there's lots of different things that we can do and these um these are micrographs um on screen so these are using a scanning electron microscope we look at the cross section of the materials that i've made so these are various um titanium these are these are actually titanium films that i've made you don't need to worry about the little sub labels but these are three uh, four titanium layers that i've made on uh probably on silicon substrate and the scale on these is a micrometer so this is about one and a half micrometers thick this is about one and a half micrometers thick they're all the same and the conditions that i used for all four of these were very similar but hopefully what you can see is that they have they look different so this is the way the material grows and the way the structure that it forms um i used one type of power supply and we get this thing that looks like a sort of more like sort of conflicts piled on top of each other so there's a lot of gaps in between it and stuff like that whereas these look a little bit more uh, glassy and dense and so there were differences in the materials depending on the uh, properties of the uh, uh, the conditions that I ran at. And so that's that's kind of what I've been doing for a long time, and that's my bread and butter. Um. So yeah. So that's magnetron sputtering. That's the you know a big huge thing of what I do. Um and i spend a lot of my time doing it at the moment i'm making different materials i'm making i'm trying to alter the structure of some 
stainless steels and I've worked with all different materials. A lot of the examples that I talked about in the first um, video, I, I was discussing thin foams for the first time. I'll have used magnetron for them, but um, what we can do is I can use I can use the same materials with pulse laser deposition and magnetron sputtering, and I might get a slightly different structure. So it might be that one's better than the other. So we've got to test that, right? We've got to go through all the different iterations in order to get the final product. In the case of photocatalytic material, we want that photocatalytic reaction. In the case of um, a conductive layer, we want basically electricity to be, you know, we want the current to be conducted. If it's a hardness layer, we want it to be super hard. And so, yeah, you can grow materials using these different techniques. Um, and hopefully we can tune the properties of them. And so that's it. Uh, now, in the next uh, video that I release, I'm actually going to take a break from talking about thin film deposition. I'm actually going to talk about superconductors. So uh, in my lab, I work in the Center for Applied Superconductivity in uh, Oxford University in the materials department and we make superconductors by pulse laser deposition and by uh, magnetron sputtering and we're trying to tune the superconducting properties and so I'll actually talk about what those superconductive properties are in the next video and I will say that my group also worked with bulk materials for superconductors but I you know I'm a material scientist so I concentrate on that. But the properties of the superconductors uh, are the same. It's just that we're trying to change and tune those properties. So uh, until next time, thanks so much for watching. And I'll see you soon. Bye.